Welcome to the the coveted 10 a.m. on Sunday slot. <laughs> I'd like all of you to open your hymnals to page 35, please. <laughs> uh, my name is Blair Chantella. I'm an attorney. I live in the Atlanta area. Uh, I have a general practice, and I focus on my personal life more so than professional uh, issues of surveillance and civil liberties. Uh, I've been following these issues for approximately six, seven years now. Um, so I have pretty extensive knowledge about these issues, and um, they're very important, I think, in my opinion. So, and as I said, I'm Scott Jones, and um, I'm a um, you know I'm a, a software developer and an IT kind of person. And I think in the mid back in the mid '90s, um, I was aware of the, the the kind of issues that that the Electronic Frontier Foundation got started under, and some of the um, so I guess some of the cyber liberties kind of issues that were coming up and I was just frustrated and not really knowing what I could do and and so I joined a group called Electronic Frontiers Georgia that's an independent group it's not a chapter of the EFF uh, it's an independent group with similar similar ideas and similar ideals and what came out of that was ultimately was Dragon Con and, and all this and so this whole program was was a part of that and um, and so again, you know that that's that's kind of why we're here today. Um, getting back to the UK investigatory powers bill, what what we're talking about today, yeah, there's been a lot of concern about what's going on in America, what's going on in the U.S. Um, you know, as we make these decisions between privacy and security, and we find in some ways that Europe is is further ahead and going down the dark path a little faster than we are at times, and and that's where the great concern lies and in some ways they're at the, they're at the bleeding edge while we're still having the debate they're going ahead and, and marching forward and doing some things that are very scary that, that are rather scary to us um, and uh, you see these kind of situations where sometimes Europe tries to lead us in a particular direction um, and even in our own country sometimes California tries to lead us in a particular regulatory re regulatory direction by um, by being the first to pass a certain kind of law so uh, you know, as we continue to scratch our heads and decide, you know, even in this, this election, I think the election coming up will have, will set some directions as to where we go versus, um, you know, privacy versus um, security. Um, those issues are, 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 are brewing hot and heavy in Europe and in the UK. And, um, you know, I, th th you know, we're going to meet these head on probably uh, sooner than we realize. So. We have a lot of tough decisions to make. It's a, it's a lot to think about, and, and there's a lot of scary implications uh, as we go down this path. Yeah, um, I concur. Uh, this is you know serious issues involving privacy and security that, unfortunately, a lot of the times we don't get to address because the government has just takes action that it views it has, without really consulting the public. So um, these types of panels and these issues, you know, are really important to keep keep going for a democracy actually so um, the issue here is the investigatory powers bill which is a piece of legislation in the United Kingdom um, several years ago uh, the head of the UK government announced that they were going to come up with some you know all-encompassing legislation to revise their surveillance powers and this is what she uh, they came up with and it was announced uh, last year in November I believe and <coughs> I'm just going to kind of go through some of the main provisions, um, and if anyone has any questions at any time, please feel free because there's not not that many people here, so <laughs> I'll have a discussion. Um, but yeah, but um, raise your hand. So raise your hand. The yes. microphone out yeah. And we'll toss you the microphone. <laughs> um, so some of the things that the initial initial bill proposed, I'll go through those. Uh, but what happened after the initial announcement of it was that there was a big uproar with the, in the civil liberties commu uh, community and uh, various UK legislators and whatnot. Um, and now it's in committee and it's going to be amended, you know, supposedly and whatnot. So, um, but initially the bill uh, creates an in investigatory powers commission that basically consolidates all the supervision of any sort of surveillance. So right now it's divided up into different agencies and different authorities, but this would basically kind of centralize that uh, power. Um, and there would be a head judge. It would be similar to the FISA court is my understanding. If you're aware of the FISA court is a secretive court here in the United States that reviews certain types of warrants and whatnot. So 
uh, it'd be very similar to that. So I would envision that it would play out the same way where, at, where a lot of the requests are just kind of rubber stamped or granted um, or whatnot. So that would be the primary concern there is like what supervision of the supervisory body would we have? What access would we have to this information considering that the requests they're going to get obviously have confidential information in them. So um, maybe we'll get a redacted opinion or something. That's about it. But other than that, you know, what are we going to get? Uh, or what will the UK citizens get? And I'll explain how this legislation could possibly affect Americans in a little bit. Um, but it would require communication service providers to uh, keep records of your web browsing history and other records for 12 months. So some jurisdictions in Europe already have this requirement uh, for a certain period of time. Uh, some IS or communication service providers or ISPs will maintain records for a certain period of time just of their own volition, but this would actually require companies to maintain all those records for 12 months, and then the government can basically obtain those records upon certain requests, which do not rise to the level of a warrant with probable cause. In, uh, certain circumstances and there are tiers of the type of information that they maintain and uh, their requirements are typically more stringent for the more personal information but even at the most personal information it doesn't rise to probable cause it's basically a certification from the secretary that it's proportional and necessary so if you've ever talked to a politician or a lawyer like myself and you ask them what proportional and necessary means you can use your imagination about how broad that's going to be. So um, that's another issue with that, that it's not really, they're talking about in the legislation to also have a double lock system, which is basically their fancy way of saying a judge is also going to sign off on it. But again, it's, it's simple. It's similar to the FISA court in that connection. Um, it has mass massive expansion of sharing of information. So local police agencies uh, can share information. Again, it's somewhat tiered in that local police agencies can't necessarily get your browsing history. Intelligence agencies can, police can't. But so there's going to be some specifications about that: uh, who gets what, who has authority to get what. But overall, there's going to be a massive increase in the sharing of the information. Um, it places a legal obligation on communication service providers to assist. Uh, the initial draft of the bill uh, actually. Uh, force them to employ their facilities. So if you were at the P FBI versus panel yesterday, it would basically require internet service providers to assist in that endeavor. Um, also, companies would be required to assist, so like Apple, Yahoo, uh, Google, their Android products and whatnot. Um, the initial version requ would require them to decrypt, uh, which would basically, basically take care of the situation with between the FBI and Apple that happened here in the United States. Um, so that would actually become a, a requirement or else they'd be breaking the law. So it raises a whole bunch of questions about how can they even do business in the UK? Um, and how can they tell their, their customers that their information is safe in the UK? Which is really sad because if you think about the UK, you think of it as a Western democracy. You think of it as this, you know, the West, the good guys versus the bad guys who believe in surveillance. And, you know, but there are, you know, there are a bunch of polls that show the index of like, freedom from a variety of factors you know whether it be property rights financial matters civil liberties you know free speech whatever and they put it in an index and they analyze all those factors and they come up with a score again this is statistics so you, you could argue that you know the methodology isn't perfect or whatnot but a variety of sources sh show uk going way down so they're going way down as far as the national or international competition i like to think of it for our privacy and civil liberties. You know, I think that we should look at it like that because civil liberties and privacy have to have a higher priority than they have. I don't think security should always trump. So I think we have to be focused on, you know, that should be a competition. That should be a goal of ours to compete in that regard. And then having that friendly competition is going to raise the bar, raise it for everyone. People be, will have creativity and come up with new ways to achieve that and still maintain our security. But if you're focused on the other thing, which is security all the time, completely focused on that, then you're going to get that. You're just going to get that. You're not going to get a full thought out process that incorporates the privacy beliefs as well. Anyways, get off my soapbox for a while if you have. <laughs> well, I would say as a technologist, um, 
that um, you know one of the things I've noticed about today's technologies is they're either very very open or very very closed and there's, there's just not really anything in the middle um, uh, you know if you if you install a back door there's there's really uh, that I think this is a something that legislators and, and, and policy people struggle with that, that they don't understand with the technology if you install a back door to anything um, then that, that there, there's no tech, there's no technology out there that can tell the good guys from the bad guys 100 percent of the time so once that once that door is open it's open and it's it's hard to secure it against e each and every comer um, so you you you're faced with with kind of a tough choice that you need to either make uh, everything wide open or everything locked down and each you know each one of those two choices um, has implications that that may be positive may be negative but this is something that I think that the average um, uh, legislator and the average person in law enforcement and the average even the average maybe policy person doesn't quite understand um, that it is just the way it is it's it, with with digital technology today and it's kind of unprecedented um, compared to when we go back to like analog phone calls um, letters being written by hand things like that the older forms of technology this kind of technology it's either very very open or very very locked down and there's just not a lot in the middle it's um, uh, it's it's not like um, you know you've got uh, a letter with the, the the message on the inside and the envelope on the outside, um, and it, it's it's hard to strike a balance in the middle. Um, and I think you, you know there's implications either way. And legislators just haven't wrapped their head around that concept. Hmm. Um, yeah, kind of kind of building off of that. Um, Typical, like legislators don't wrap their heads around the, that concept, but a lot of the times it's sort of out of their hands. I would just kind of add to that. Oh, question. I mean, just when there's time, when there's yeah. a break. I don't think oh. Know. Well, I have a couple of things. Why? Hello, hello. Um, why do I care about the UK? Why, why is this important to me? That's, you know, here I'm in this session because I went to the FBI Apple one. I totally get that, why that's important to me, but why is the UK, this snoopers charter, um, an issue that I need to really be aware of? Well, it, it's definitely true that uh, the USA is in a leadership position that um, when we have good policy, you know, we try to export democracy, we try to export good policies, but we, when we set bad policies for ourselves, those also get exported. Um, I think there is a great concern in this country that as Europe goes further down the dark path, that that's going to, um, that's going to affect uh, at least the arguments um, back, in, back in our court. Uh, you know, ap the Apple phones, they're manufactured in China, but they're designed in the USA. And uh, eventually, from a, from a regulation point of view, if enough countries in Europe um, mandate a backdoor or mandate whatever, um, that becomes a requirement here. And it makes things a lot more complicated here. So, you know, do you have to make two kinds of smartphones, one for Europe, one for America? Uh, or do, do they make only one kind of smartphone? And we try to turn off the backdoor feature in America if it isn't required, but somebody finds a way to hack it in. So it does have a ripple effect. I mean, because uh, there's, you know, today we don't make different iPhones for different countries. It's, it's one iPhone. And if those requirements ripple back into, um, you know, uh, you can say that with any technology. Um, if those requirements ripple back into the U.S. where we design them here, uh, if we have to, to do them differently for different countries, we can bring in a lot of risk that essentially spreads across the go globe. So as, as, as soon as you have a critical mass in any one part of the globe, um, uh, th it can affect everybody. Does that mean that you take and decrypt our email then on the FBI? They do that? Well, if, they, you know, if the FBI can't do it, probably the UK can't today. But um, you know, that's the, the question is tomorrow. This, this becomes a slippery slope. So if we enable this, um, for any country, then, um, you know, if, if the UK can do it, then Europe can do it, the US can do it, and eventually China and Russia can do it. Um, they're, they're pretty smart about what they, they have smart people. And, and then and you just get to the point where everything's wide open to everyone, and that's the problem.
I, my curiosity would be like, if we're fighting again, you know, against it in the UK, saying, "Hey, this is wrong." What about in uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan? Um, yeah, US? sure. I mean, this is a trickle-down effect, and eventually, every country is going to want this. Every government already wants this, you know, from a point of view, and 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 they're 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 mad that they can't just um, pass an edict and make it happen, but the technology is coming from other countries like the USA and, um, um, you know, they'd like to be able to snap their fingers and, and change the technology. Um, it's, it's like uh, uh, Professor Lawrence Lessig said, code is law. It's like once you code something, you, once you code something in a particular way, you can change the law all you want. It doesn't automatically go back and magically change all the code. It doesn't magically change the device. It's kind of an architectural thing. If you build, um, you know, when, when architect, uh, the, the building regulations change over time, but if you change a building regulation, the old buildings that were built to the old standards don't magically go back and reform to, to, to meet that, you know, the old, the old buildings are still there. So this is kind of an architectural issue. We've written our technology to, to meet the standards of the day. If we change that tomorrow, um, the old technology isn't going to go back and change. But we do have a slippery slope looking forward into the future as, you know, all these changes that have um, potential unintended consequences. Um, and that's, that's where we're concerned, the two of us, and uh, uh, why we're up here. Um, is looking at the unintended consequences as we go forward down this path. Yeah, I kind of th I think of think of it as setting just basically in common sense terms. You know, setting a bad example. You know, whenever you have kind of a group of people and then a majority of them agree to do a certain course of action, there tends to be a <coughs> a following a about that. So when you have the leaders of a group doing something, which in, by way of analogy would be like the international community. So in a lot of ways, the UK is a leader in the, in the world. You know, America is a leader in the world. And so we have basic, you know, a lot of ways, the ability to control the social norms of the international community. And so I think that on a basic level, that you have to view that as a serious responsibility and, and perpetuate the things. But you, you can easily get sucked in. There's a temptation, I mean, to get sucked into the easy way out, which is just more and more surveillance, the shortcut, the shortcut, the easy way out. And then it just becomes a downward spiral. So that's just the human nature thing that people struggle with all the time. In small groups, international communities, you know, these governments and our elected leaders are just people like anyone else. So um, I'd like to keep it on the kind of that level or think of it as that level, on that level. I can't talk this morning. <laughs> I, I think another thing, um, Another way to look at it is that um, if you look at the internet technologies from the last 20 years, they've been a profound engine for, for economic growth. And um, if we start to, to, to pass these kinds of laws uh, that create a chilling effect, I think it's going to create a chilling effect on, on economic growth too. It's not just about, um, not an academic argument about our privacy and security. When we start to um, you know, when we start to restrain ourselves, we start to restrain what we do. Um, this pervasive, uh, 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 this pervasive surveillance can extend beyond the government sector and into the private sector. So, you know, if if major company A sees the the great innovation from minor company B that could threaten their market, um, all of a sudden you created um, a way to, to 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 get rid of disruptive innovation. And it might be that major company A has, a, has connections in the government that lets them spy on their competitors. Um, this is just one example. But if you eliminate the entire system of disruptive innovation, you eliminate the engine that's powered, the economic engine that's, that's really powered the internet revolution for the last 20 years. And so we could get to the point where we, um, in, in this, this era of pervasive surveillance, where we get to a kind of a, a, a steady state economy where nothing ever grows and, and it becomes stagnation. We've seen <coughs> stagnation in markets. I mean, like, look at what has happened to the, the broadcast market before internet. It was, a, um, it was pretty stagnant. In the music market before the internet, it was pretty stagnant. It was hard to find the growth. Um, and we're headed back into a, we're headed back on a path that's going back in that direction if we have this pervasive surveillance where you can't have disruptive innovation anymore because everybody knows everything all the time and they can they can react to, to, to you know prevent competition even I was more talking about the inconsistencies possible the possibility of inconsistencies in the u 
U.S. government, okay, Britain, that's bad, you can't do that. Okay, Afghanistan, you know, that's good, you can do that. Because there's a possibility, higher possibility of somebody attacking the U.S. I mean, I guess it's more on a global scope. Exactly Are you talking right about there. international security as, as well, in kind of the balancing? We're talking about the, the super mm -hmm. well, and the U.S. is going, hey, wait a minute, not a good idea. But then what if um, a dictatorship was passing the same kind of law or attempting to? Would the U.S. hold the same policy, the same view on it, or would they turn around and say, wait a minute, we like it over here? Well, I, I kind of think of that as... as in general like so if when our country goes to war in certain areas like let's say afghanistan so the stated purpose is to bring freedom or in democracy so i i was you know if you brainstorm like okay what would that involve literally that means they have freedom of speech and the bill of rights so are we sending our military over there saying here's the bill of rights we're going to protect these for you like is that what our soldiers are actually doing over there as a practical matter Imagine if they did that. That would be literally doing what we're saying. But what happens is that we're not, you know, it's like the stated purpose is different than what actually happens. I mean, if we want to bring civil liberties and civil rights, we could apply our constitutional law to another country or something similar. Imagine that. That would be actually consistent with the stated purpose for going over there. So it sort of touches on that same issue of, sort of like a double think that's sort of a cliche term where you can hold the same ideas in your head that conflict so you think we're bringing liberty to one place when really if you actually delve into it and apply your brain to the thought of whether that's true or not you'll actually discover that it's not true literally there's a contradiction there and it takes some sorting out you really have to apply yourself sometimes but there's replete you know examples are replete in politics especially war especially about that kind of thing so i think that's kind of what you're talking about, yeah, I'm just talking about the it's inconsistent yeah and and for searching for the truth then it's important to notice those inconsistencies so i just wanted to s switch back to keeping um 12 months of the records of your searching um i've been using x quick for a couple of years is that truly private uh for those who don't know i th believe x quick is a search engine that uses Google results, but it, it acts as an intermediary and it shields all your personal information for the search. Um, as far as I know, it's it's heralded as secure and anonymizing. So, yeah. Do you know anything about that? I think you have to ask yourself, um, what's the worst case scenario? What if they got presented with a national security letter? What if they got presented with, I don't know if they're in the country or not, first of all. What if they got presented in law enforcement? What's the, what's the, um, uh, the, the worst thing that could happen. Uh, in general, it's it's probably pretty safe, but it's hard to be a hundred percent sure. And I mean, uh, hopefully that hopefully they're using HTTPS, which is um, you've got the little lock icon on your browser and it's secure, so they can't really see what you're going to. But they can, I your ISP can certainly see which site that you're going to because it can see the DNS traffic. So unless you're using something like a VPN, it can still <coughs> the fact that you're using that service can still be tied back to you even if they can't see the details of what you're searching for. So that's something to be um, to be aware of. Um, you can use a combination of VPN and Tor on top of that for additional layer of security to, to keep it from being, to, to, to improve your security to make it harder to tie it back to you. The purpose of Tor is anonymity, not privacy. Um, and you need to keep, there's a subtle distinction between the two and so you need to keep that in mind. But um, you, uh, the privacy should come from the HTTPS and you would get anonymity from Tor and you could use VPN to further shield your DNS traffic. If you use the combination of all that, you may sound pretty paranoid, but you know, that, that gives you that, that those multiple la layers of protection. Um, if you go onto the EFF.org website, um, they have um, a more, um, a, 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 I guess, a, a user-friendly discussion of, of those technologies. So. You know, I suggest um, trying Tor. I suggest trying a VPN just to become familiar with it and do ordinary stuff with it that that isn't um, that that you aren't necessarily interested in shielding, just to become comfortable with it. And that provides some some extra measure uh, 
of security yeah. because it's hard to know who's being served with the subpoena these days. Yeah, different VPNs have different data retention policies as well. Some will swear up and down. They don't hold anything. Some will for a short period or some won't. Um, but it varies and it, it fluctuates uh, between the VPNs and their services. Generally, the smaller ones afford more privacy. That's the general rule for that. But. Uh, I, two questions. The first, um, with respect to the UK Charter, is this is this the piece of legislation that requires companies to give the decryption key to the government? And second, can you compare what's going on with the UK Charter with generally what's going on in the EU with respect to that type of legislation? Uh, I don't know as much about the EU, but this bill basically would force the companies to, the original version of the bill, would force the companies to assist in decryption. Um, which as a practical matter would be forcing them to create unencrypted or backdoors, in my opinion. Um, since that was introduced, there was a, a big reaction from the civil liberties and Google, um, Yahoo, Facebook actually wrote a letter, you know, saying this is a bad idea. The uh, Rapporteur on Privacy in the U uh, EU or UN, I believe, I don't have it in front of me, but he came out against it saying it was horrible legislation. So what happened is that it was passed the House of Commons, and now it's in a committee, and it's going to be amended similar to our pro our system. So who knows what amendments are going to have? But the Home Secretary, um, which I understand is similar to our Department of Homeland Security official, <laughs> not an expert on UK politics, but she came out and said that the revisions they're going to put uh, are going to take into account that and not force decryption. But the language she's using is sort of vague, so it's sort of like if it's not feasible or if it's not overly burdensome. So again, it's one of those terms that lawyers use, you know, is it or is it not overly burdensome? And even if it is, excuse me, even if it is overly burdensome, to get that de to determination is going to cost someone a lot of resources to the judicial process. So the end result, as a practical matter, that's always what it comes down to with these things. First layer, what it says literally, in theory, ooh, sounds good, sounds good, as a practical matter, that's what happens. Very few people, if you're here about the NSA panel, you could see that hundreds of thousands of NSLs are sent out each year as a practical matter because it's so cost inhibitive or prohibitive to challenge them, nobody challenges them. But there's still that you know, perception or the talking points that you could put out there that it's really good because it has all these measures. So, sorry I got off on a tangent there, but I hope that answers your question. The EU, um, Scott, do you know anything about the... Yeah, unfortunately I don't know as much about it. I think there was a, a announcement recently that, that EU is doing its own thing and it's hard to know if UK is going to be swept into that because they're leaving the, the, the EU but they haven't, they haven't really left yet. So it's hard to know how that's all going to mesh out. But the EU is doing its own thing. Um, and then as, you, as the UK leaves, it's hard to know. I mean, I think that what I'm hearing from the UK investigatory powers bill, it may go beyond what the EU is, is talking about. But I think the EU is talking about also mandating um, at least open access to smartphones uh, with the back door. I, I think I read that in the last week or so. And I'm sorry I don't have more specifics on it. Yeah. I. I came across a couple of cases the other day the EU court had ruled that some of the UK laws were violated the privacy rights so in some ways the EU has some actually above average privacy laws and so yeah the UK <laughs> so you have to change your mindset about the UK being this bastion of liberty in the Western democracies in a way um, the UK is violating European privacy law now and according to some court opinion. So um, the whole Brexit thing, coincidentally, or however you want to put it, it's kind of coinciding with that. UK is kind of backing away from the EU. They want to have their privacy laws. They want to have their mass surveillance. And they don't, you know, it's sort of like you follow us or else, you know, we're just going to leave. And they're a big economic, what, the biggest one you said? Biggest part of the EU, as far as I know, economically. So... Oh, Germany is? Okay. Well, they're top three, I'll say, then. <laughs> but. Yeah, so the, and we have, you know, Americans have to be reminded that the 
um, UK doesn't necessarily have a Bill of Rights that that, that applies as strongly, yeah. and and the um, the kind of uh, rights that they have in their society are not as ironclad. So, um, and I think there is a tendency if you go back to George Orwell's 1984, which um, I guess I had to to, um, I, to read as a, you know back as a student back in my student days. Um, if you if you go back to that, um, those tendencies. Having, even though the technology is very different um, than today, the tendencies, I think, have existed in British society for a long time. And that's really what the book is more about, is that tendency to, to want to go down that path, that path of this, this feeling, this vague feeling of security in exchange for freedom, liberty, privacy, et cetera, et cetera. And that's, that's what uh, the book is really a warning about. The other problems with the bill, um, the three purposes for getting the information in this investigatory powers bill uh, would be national security the prevention or detection of serious crime so again what is serious crime you know define that uh, or safeguarding the economic well-being of the UK how more much more broader can you get than that um, so again it, it you know as a practical matter <laughs> you know it, it who's gonna challenge that you know if it's secret if the Homeland Secretary signs off on it and it's a FISA, secret FISA court that approves it, who's going to have a chance to argue what those terms should mean? Or well, economic well-being could be, you know, economic spying that has nothing to do with, with um, national security. Unfortunately, we know that was happening in America Yeah. because of the Snowden revelations. Yeah. So, um, I actually have a question. Um, so this kind of ties back with what you all were talking about with Brexit. So... I mean, the Home Office is not a new institution. As far as I understand, it's a pretty old institution in British government. Um, and so now Brexit is apparently happening. There's a small chance it won't, but it, for all intents and purposes, looks like it's going to happen. Could Brexit contain this to the UK and the Commonwealth of Nations, i.e. the British Empire? Could it kind of keep it in that direction and maybe keep the, U the EU on another path, possibly? Um. You know, my, uh, my, I, I don't have a lot of specific information, but my gut feeling is that, um, that the, the Brexit is actually could potentially make things worse. Um, you know, the EU is doing some bad things, but they also have a lot of, they also um, value privacy um, and ha is, it's more explicitly written into their charters than it is um, in our Bill of Rights, um, it's, it's, it's very explicit, and they have some very strong protections. So I think it weighs heavily on their conscious, conscience. Um, I'm really concerned that as Brexit, as we go down the Brexit path, that, that the UK is actually going to become worse than it would have been if it had stayed in. Um, That's because, my opinion too. Yeah, I think that, yeah. Uh, we're really worried about that. And if you look at the kind of motivations um, that brought that on. Those motivations are, are, are probably lead you down into a, um, a darker path towards you know security being the top value of the of the of the culture everywhere. And if that's the top value, it it, it means that that liberty, freedom, privacy, those sorts of things get left by the wayside. So it's really very troubling. Uh, the Brexit itself is troubling, and the, this UK investig investigatory powers bill and where it could lead beyond that is even more troubling to me. The UK is already not a model for civil liberties. I mean, if they have cameras everywhere, I mean, <laughs> you know, they're huge. I, I can't imagine why. That's why it's a little bit stupefying to me because it's like they want even more power. I mean, they have, the places, Andrew would be able to talk a bit about this. Yeah. But, uh, uh, they have cameras everywhere. They have, you know, they're already bulk data sets it recently came out that they have been collecting bulk data sets since like 96 I think basically bulk data sets involve or they have the ability to again it's signed by some high up official but he just has to sign off that it's proportional and necessary um, but bulk data sets involve metadata essentially about your travel which institutions you bank at who you're communicating with um, you know your anything that you know metadata about your day-to-day -day life they've just been collecting um, when the sec or whoever signs off on it basically so this in a way would codify that so the UK bill would actually codify that and formalize that in a broader you know applicability 
um, and they could just do it and then they would have to still have to get a warrant to search the information but so all your information is being collected but does that make you feel comfortable that they have everything and then they just have to get a warrant or someone to sign off on it to search it that doesn't make me feel comfortable um, that it's not going to be misused or whatever so and there, there have been a lot of examples of it being misused um, but just to give you another idea they're, when they're talking about browsing history you know Theresa May came out and she's the head of the yeah over there and she says oh it's not your browsing it's not everything every web page you visited or anything like that but it is the sites you go to so the distinction she's making is that for example if you go to cnn.com that would be included in the information that they give or that they get but if you go to a specific page on a spe about a specific article it wouldn't so cnn.com is metadata under their definitions but that cnn.com slash whatever html address for a news article on a specific topic would not be that would be content so that's sort of a in my opinion a cop out i mean you could tell a lot of information about someone just based on the domain they go to so i think moving forward you're going to see a lot more discussion about you know metadata versus content and you know the ongoing debate has been whether metadata equals content at what point if you keep collecting metadata enough metadata it creates a picture of someone's life so um and there's just not a lot of legislation on that uh not a lot of protective legislation on that issue so yeah this bill is i, I have a feeling it's going to be heavily modified at least in the public uh the public version of it uh the intelligence agencies they have other authorities that they've been using like uh Snowden documents have released, you know, revealed like Tempora, which is a full uptake system. They maintain all this information on people. Um, they have certain rules of whether someone's a U.S. citizen or not, or excuse me, U.K. citizen or not. However, if they can't determine if you're a U.K. citizen, then they just collect it anyways. So anyone using anonymizing Tor, it's collected. You know, anyone, you know, if you're a U.K. citizen, you have certain rights, but you should have the right to anonymous, anonymously communicate online, I would think. Um, so anyhow, it goes back to the problem of mass surveillance, I think. Um, what do you think, Scott? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let's, let's assume for a moment that it was um, passed you know, in, its, in its draft form, you know, as it was today. I mean, the next step is that when people realize they're being surveilled all the time, they're going to use more anti-surveillance technology. So I... I'm, I'm sure that this would create a, a, a sense of crisis in the home office and in, in, in the government that, that they need to take the next legis legislator, you know, legislative step and crack down on VPN or crack down on TOR or something like that. And then you see an endless cycle of um, more regulation followed by new technology that works around the regulation followed by more regulation on that technology. And the question is where does it end? So um, I think that when the legislators are crafting these um, these policies. They need to realize that 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 this is the inevitable result of the policies. Um, if you can extrapolate and you can say that this is, in a sense, this doesn't really solve the problem. I think they're fooling themselves into believing that this legislative approach will solve their problems, and they don't realize that they're opening a can of worms with the next generation of technology that's going to try to work around it. Another interesting aspect of the bill was the equipment interference, which basically the bill would allow them to apply for a warrant to hack someone's device. Or not even a warrant, just, you know, it's necessary and proportional, according to the secretary and the, this FISA-ish court judge or official. Um, so that's sort of unprecedented as well. I mean, so that's without a warrant? Yeah, as far as I know. Okay. Yeah. I'm looking here on the this is the this is the the UK government's fact sheet so I have a bunch of these this is their PR campaign about the legislation so <laughs> here sir I'd like to hand that to you <laughs> if you all want to look at that there's some there's some key points in there um, but it definitely would apply to cell phones uh, they've discussed that but I assume it would just apply to 
to any any computer or device you know whether it's a router whether it's a cell phone whether it's a computer um, so if you're doing something the government finds suspicious uh, they could sign off on it and your home computer could be hacked that's essentially what that is again that's the original version of the bill we'll see what happens but um, EI operations equipment interference operations may involve remotely installing a piece of software onto a device so uh, currently the Secretary of State issues warrants considering the necessity and proportionality of the need to use investigatory powers so technically it's a warrant but I guess it's not a warrant in the sense that a judicial officer would issue it like the United States so the Secretary of State issues the warrant and then they're proposing a double lock authorization which would uh, require a judicial commissioner to sign off on it so basically one guy in the same fraternity as the other guy <laughs> signs off on his buddies thing you can imagine I mean if you know anything about human nature and how governments work sometimes a lot of the times you get very incestuous sort of relationships where there's no real opposing viewpoints when there should be on these issues so um, that's a big risk there needs to be more transparency with that um, yeah. already covered that they'd be required to keep records for 12 months it's interesting because I think the bill doesn't necessarily anticipate the the potential impact of open source software um, this is kind of today's today's smartphones are, are um, well the Android I mean it, you can you can get an open source version of Android but today's smartphone environments are, are pretty much closed environments but this could a bill of this sort could uh, potentially spur an interest in open source uh, mobile devices open source phones where you just buy a piece of hardware and then you um, go out and load the operating system of your choice on there and if you feel like that you've been potentially compromised you can you can just um, go out and wipe the device and and, and put uh, another operating system of your choice on the on the device so today you're very dependent on the the, the hardware manufacturer for the software this kind of thing uh, maybe in the future um, the hardware and software may kind of split and you may go kind of just just go out to the internet and pick and choose what kind of software you want in the future uh, this is another thing that I don't think that they've anticipated in this in this bill um, they've written it for the technology of today and that could change very quickly um, it could pivot very quickly if there's sort of a chilling environment created by this bill and, and one particular answer is to um, redesign the mobile phone to be more amenable to open source um, even more so than Android way above and beyond Android where you're basically going out and, and running your own mini version of Linux or something like that and obviously not everybody's going to do that but um, it's going to it could open the door for that and if that happens you know you you have some greater sense of assurance about what's really running and what's not running um, on your on your mobile phone and you know if you're concerned that that oh it's using it's using up the battery twice as fast as it used to. I wonder if it's running a spy program. Um, you'll have a greater access to software um, that could go in and look at it at a deeper level than you can. For, uh, Apple, for Apple in particular today is a very locked down environment and um, you really can't go out and just get software that, lo that looks down at a very deep level and tries to figure out is there some kind of spyware running on this. So that th th there's good things and bad things about today's Apple today's iOS it is a, a lockdown and more secure environment but it's also harder to bring in a third-party tool that would um, look deeper into the device and see if there's some kind of spyware running and I think that the this bill is written uh, the bill is obviously written for the technology of today and the technology could pivot very quickly um, to, to kind of route around um, some of the uh, some of the more chilling effects of it, but of course, then regulators can come back with their their face too. So it it becomes maybe kind of like a never-ending battle. So I think one of the reasons to oppose some of this at this point is to kind of anticipate this this back and forth struggle that that could that could uh, occur between uh, the law and the technology. And I think that if you inject some reasonableness into the debate at this point. Um, you would prevent uh, you would prevent these back and forth struggles down the road. I agree. 
That's why we're here, hopefully. <laughs> um, here's another talking point from their fact sheet here. It says communications data, CD. It says it provides judicial authorization for requests by public authorities acquiring communications data to identify or confirm a journalistic source. Mm -hmm. So that's directly on their fact sheet. So that's been another, here, you seem interested in this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not lying, that's right on there. Um, so it's just blatant, in my opinion, uh, a lot of the stuff. Um, it's sort of like their campaign to push this legislation is shock and awe. Sort of throw out the worst version first, and then once th we have a chance to process it, and we they'll they'll concede a little bit, but they'll still get a vast majority of what they want. Maybe I say S screw that. I say we oppose it and defeat the whole entire thing, and make them rewrite it from the ground up responsibly with our input. Kind of a kind of a mindset. Um, but the issue about how it relates to the United States is that the United States and the UK are part of this Five Eyes network, which the Snowden documents released or disclosed. Um, and there's a lot of information sharing. So the way it's set up right now is that the UK and the United States can query the, a lot of the same databases. There's a database called X Keyscore um, that they can, the UK can query uh, that has information that we have obtained. Uh, who here is not that familiar at all with the Five Eyes or Snowden and all that? Is anyone? Who is familiar? <laughs> okay, all right, so-so. Um, basically what happened is that when Snowden released all these documents, one of the main things uh, he disclosed was this X Keyscore program, which is essentially the front end, uh, Scott might be able to explain a little better, but it's a front end, which is like a search engine that brings together all the data that we uh, accumulate, and it's not only our data, but it's data from other countries, the five eyes, which I believe are like Australia, UK, um, and we share that information with other countries. So if the UK law says we're gonna lessen our data uh, restrictions on collecting data, and, it only, and we can collect all this information on people outside the UK, well, that means they can collect information that routes these cables in international waters. So a lot of our information transits those international cables because when you email someone, even if it's domestically, the data could flow outside the United States, go through these different cables, and it may go a different way the next time you do it. So unless you can distinguish yourself or as a U.S. citizen or U.K. citizen, you're just going to be swept up in this dragnet surveillance, and then you're going to be put into this database along with your metadata and the content uh, UK has a tempora system which collects content, retains it for 30 days, and then purges out the stuff it's certain it doesn't need, and then it holds on to stuff it may need in the future, um, just because they can't store everything. Um, but that's just going to go into a database, and then it could be searched according to these authorities that the UK bill's uh, proposing. And they explicitly set out that the you know the government can search these things and collect information on people outside of the UK. So there really needs to be an international consensus. It's, you know, if one country does one thing, it sort of, sort of creates a race to the bottom mentality, where if one country's doing it, we need to do it. We're going to be at a disadvantage. Uh, it seems similar to me as a, a sort of like taxation, where if you have a lower tax bracket or you give favorable treatment, the company's going to move to a different location. So in that way, it's sort of like we have to have a consensus to combat this, this risk of of going down that path like Scott says so yeah so even if you think this is a, a UK only matter we are really all in this together all these systems are tied together and it, 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 it does hurt us even if we didn't pass anything like this at all it's, it still is going to hurt us down the road any any questions Anything else you wanted to cover? Any personal surveillance stories? <laughs> Anyone worried that they're being followed right now? <laughs> I, I mean, are you understanding the the concerns that we're bringing up? Or does that is that that's making sense to you? I have a story I'd like to tell since we have some time. I, when I was in college, it was let's see, I got out of the military in two thousand, right, mom? 
and I went into college. I went to Washington State University, and I think it was my second year there. It was after the September 11th attacks, and I was downstairs in the rec center. They had a rec center there, and I was playing pool. Uh, I used to be a big pool player, um, billiards, whatever. And two guys approached me. I was playing pool with them for a while, and they were, they were, I was talking with them. They are cool guys, you know, a little bit older than me, but whatever. And so they go, hey, can we talk to you for a second? And I thought that, I was like, that's strange. So I'm like, okay. And they go, well, come over here. And there was a little alcove where it was kind of behind some pop machine. We call it pop in Washington, not soda or Coke here. But uh, anyway, there were some pop machines. And so we went behind those. And the guy flips out as an FBI agent. And so he asked me, basically the gist of the conversation, um, you know, was that we want you to, you know, give us some information and go around to these different groups and, you know, nothing formal, nothing too, you know, invasive or anything, you know, just license plate numbers, people who go to these certain meetings, whatnot. And he says, you can't tell anyone we had this conversation. Now here's my card and think about it and let me know. Pardon? <laughs> you can leave it rolling. By now they know my opinion on this situation. I'm sure they have it somewhere in their file. This guy declined. He's a insurgent or something. But uh, anyhow, I, I declined and uh, basically he said, you cannot call uh, anyone. You can't tell anyone or anything about what my offer or this situation. But let, think about it and let us know. Well, I called one person. I think it was grandma or something. <laughs> and I called one person, just one person. Maybe that was a test. They told me explicitly not to talk to anyone. But anyhow, I called the number he gave me, and uh, I was going to decline formally, but no one answered, and I never got a call back from him. So maybe he, they knew I called someone. They were, that was a test or something. I don't know. But at any rate, it was kind of an eye-opener to me. Uh, you know, stuff like that happens. So, I mean, I was in the FBI panel, <clears throat> FBI versus Apple panel the other day. First question I asked was like, is there anyone here from the FBI? Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> because that happens. There are FBI agents that will attend stuff like this. So you kind of have to disabuse yourself of the idea that the government doesn't do those types of things. And if you know a little bit about history and, you know, um, they didn't get that, that much of detail. But, yeah, unfortunately, I didn't learn that much detail about that. Yeah. It just came out in the paper probably two months ago that FBI has been going Burning Man for the last several years. And that was freely admitted that they've been doing that. Hmm. Yeah, anytime you have interesting ideas and people and there's a social atmosphere, I kind of play devil's advocate in my own mind sometimes. I try to understand why they do these things. You know, so I kind of role play, brainstorm. So, yeah, my thought is anytime you have interesting ideas and people, they want to understand trends. They want to understand what motivates people. They want to sort of control and understand. And, you know, that that runs against um, some core beliefs about human nature, I think, are valuable. You know, self-determination, freedom, free will, that kind of thing. So that's really kind of what all of this whole debate comes down to, in my opinion, is like, how do we how do we preserve those values in this new era of technology and all these cool advances in technology we have? We like I mean, we like playing Pokemon Go and all this stuff, but uh, you know it comes at a cost, and we need to be raise awareness about it. So, but that's interesting that they went to Burning Man. That doesn't surprise me at all, though. The article yeah. Said that Mm -hmm. they, they didn't elaborate on exactly what it was, but mm -hmm. they said it was a, a kind of a test bed for trying out new technology for surveillance. Yeah, they got in trouble. I think it was the FBI got in trouble one year because they monitored the whole the communications of the whole entire city where a Super Bowl was held or something. I don't remember exactly what year, but they monitored everyone. It was like the first time they did it as like a test to see what, like, I assume to see what the data would look like coming in, whether it would be useful to see all the trends, all the communications, all the location of all the cell phones, everything, like just testing, you know, the capability of something, you know, as a practical matter. So I mean, stuff happens all the time. You hear about protests, uh, 
being monitored, Black Lives Matter stuff. Uh, what is it? The uh, what's that one? Ninety nine percent movement. Uh, you know what I'm talking. Occupy Wall. Oh, Occupy oh, Wall oh, Street. Oh. Stories come out about F. Bastard Man. It's there as well. Um, just you know, stingray devices being used to simulate cell towers, monitoring location of everyone. I mean, there are data. I mean, there are algorithms they will use to map people's locations, and they're based on their metadata. These graphical things where they can see if the relationship structure changes, they can glean information about people's ideas changes, predict a protest, predict violence or whatever. So it gets really, really technical when they have access to all this data. And, and if you're heading out to a protest, uh, there's this wonderful thing on your phone called airplane mode. <laughs> I haven't heard about that. <laughs> you can kind of go in stealth. The FBI, I think, or was it the, I think it was the FBI, they, they broke the Tor network and they were able to identify this pedophile ring, apparently, based off research from a university. They had farmed out or someone had sold them the information and they'd used a private entity or outside government because university isn't private. But, um, yeah, they have the money, so it's really hard to turn down when you see a government project that says, oh, help us in this benign issue look at all this money we'll give you. And so a lot of the times that the moral, the ethical issues just causes people to gloss over. It's like money, <laughs> money, money. So it, you know, it's important to stop and think about these issues. And yeah, the, the government by and large isn't, isn't governments by and large aren't building their own technologies, but in the wake of 9-11, a lot of money was, was poured into the technology sector. And uh, there, you know, there is there is some some good law enforcement technology out there, but there's also a lot of snake oil, and there's sort of a gold rush into this area. Um, and uh, a lot of the companies, you know, it's not incumbent on the companies when they're building a new surveillance product to to ask themselves, uh, are they compliant with the Bill of Rights or not? Um, so you uh, you know they they just basically they're just out there to sell the stuff. <coughs> And the, they're, they're not accountable in the same way that the government is. It's ultimately the government that does the operation is in, in, and is accountable. But there's a lot of technology out there, and it is getting a little off topic, but it is sort of on topic too. Um, there's a lot of technology out there where the, the, the freedom of speech, privacy, or the Bill of Rights is an afterthought because they're just out there to sell product. And this is the kind of, you know, this is the kind of thing that can get the kind of products that can get sold back into a government, whether it's UK or US or, 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 or whatever, um, there's been a gold rush into surveillance technology and, and it's creating a lot of, it's moving a lot faster than the laws are moving. Even if the laws are mo seem to be moving quickly, this technology is moving more quickly. Uh, when you hear about that Burning Man situation, I don't, you know, I have no way of knowing exactly, but I'll bet you that it's um, some kind of new product that somebody sold them that, and they're testing it. Um, and, you know, whether it is, is Bill of Rights compliant or not, it, it probably isn't because the, the it's not incumbent on the technology um, provider to, 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 to adhere to the Bill of Rights. But, you know, when you hear uh, about the government testing technology, they're almost certainly testing third-party technology because they're generally not, you know, they're really not an in-house uh, technology shop. Yeah, I think we're almost done here. But yeah, yeah my, one final thought. My my main beef is not with the FBI doing their job. It's just to make sure that throughout the process, you know, the inherently good human qualities are preserved and discussed and there's an ongoing debate. I, I just don't like the idea that all this stuff's being decided in private and then citizens are forced to challenge it in court, but it's extremely cost prohibited. You know, that's the... It's a problem because if you, even if you challenge it, you're going to spend, I think we talked about NSLs. It took 11 years to challenge the redaction of one page of an NSL. So 
Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, 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 and there just seems to be an endless ocean of unintended consequences right. from, from these kind of bills, and, and that's, that's troubling. So, you know, I, you'll want to see the, the technology people get involved in the process um, and help us through, uh, help us understand that. Um, the legislators can, can tend to have a very simple-minded approach and really have to just know, they're just not well equipped to consider even the, the slightest possible unintended consequence coming from this. But there's, there's, all, there's certainly to be an, uh, unintended consequences coming from this kind of measure. Thank and you so much for coming yeah, thanks. on and, and Sunday morning. <laughs> Y'all can contact me, I'll give you an hour of free legal advice. <laughs> Just mention this panel. <laughs>